Greetings, fellow gorehounds, and welcome back to Blood Splattered Cinema, where I put the laughter back in the slaughter. And today, we're going to talk about King Kong vs. Godzilla, which is not to be confused, of course, with its American remake, Godzilla vs. Kong, or its god-awful asylum ripoff, Ape vs. Monster, or even its sequel, King Kong Escapes, otherwise known as King Kong vs. Megacon. Or at least it fucking should be anyway. No, today we are talking about the original King Kong vs. Godzilla. And normally I'd say except no substitutes, except, well, this time the remake was actually pretty damn good. Anyway, enough wasting time. Let's see what kind of taglines we got going on on this here poster. The two mightiest monsters of all time in the most colossal conflict the screen has ever known. Oh my, oh my, oh my, ah! Now, I don't know about that. I mean, Mega Shark versus Giant Octopus was pretty fucking colossal. Colossally awful, that is. Holy shit. It's beautiful, beautiful cinema. Bad American kaiju flicks aside, King Kong vs. Godzilla is a 1962 Japanese kaiju film produced by Toho for the company's 30th anniversary. And it just so happened to have been released to such a massive success, it single-handedly encouraged Toho to produce way more Godzilla vs. films, to the point where they were basically pumping them out in a yearly cycle. Kinda like me with Blood Splattered Cinema episodes, now that I think about it. Man, I really should produce these more often. Fuck you, clinical depression! Tragically though, as awesome as that was for Toho and for kaiju fans worldwide, it was far less so for the man who originally came up with that idea, Willis H. O'Brien. You see, Willis was an animator on the original King Kong and had written a treatment for a proposed sequel in which King Kong battled a souped up Frankenstein's monster. He made the unfortunate mistake, however, of taking this idea to RKO Pictures, where producer John Beck sold the treatment to Toho behind Willis's back. Naturally, his treatment was then rewritten into a script by Sinichi Sekizawa, and Frankenstein's monster was eventually replaced with, you guessed it, Godzilla. Which is kind of funny in retrospect, given that just three years later, Toho would go on to make their own Frankenstein kaiju film anyway. In the end, though, O'Brien would receive zero credit for his work, while Beck would go on to rake in all of the profits with his highly altered, Americanized cut. Because here in America, we can't handle movies that aren't centered around us. Ain't that right, Mr. Del Toro? old-fashioned American brand racism aside, it turns out King Kong vs. Godzilla actually has a lot of firsts for both franchises. For one, it was the first in either series to be filmed in either color or widescreen. For two, it was the very first time King Kong was depicted by a man in an ape suit, which some subsequent movies would, uh, follow suit. <laughs> And for three, it was the first of either franchise to directly target a younger audience. Holy Jesus. What is that? What the fuck is that? So without further ado, let's get drunk on some berry juice and hope that lightning strikes twice. Because this week's gargantuan gorilla engagement is none other than King Kong versus Godzilla. And then they kiss. And so our movie opens with, what else, an opening title sequence. I like 
like how the rest of these credits are just like normal ass fonts, but then the title card is just like, let's get racist. Let's get really racist. Straight up Mel Gibson this shit. Meanwhile, on the set of my fifth grade science project, brought to you by Universal Studios, let's take a listen to what's going on over here in overly epic voiceover land. Which is apparently the land I live in, according to some. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Of course, what giant monster brawl wouldn't be complete without a Hamlet quote? I mean, who among us can forget that magnificent intro to Boa vs. Python? What a piece of work is man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculty! Is that a giant fucking snake? And where would our American dub be without some obligatory extra footage featuring white actors just to make sure Americans don't forget who the dominant race is? That's barely a joke, by the way. Universal actually spent three days filming brand new scenes to bookend the movie in order to make the movie feel more American. And of course, by American, they they meant meant more more white. white. As the series of earthquakes continue to destroy Chile, the United Nations has granted immediate emergency aid. And by emergency aid, we mean carpet bombs filled with Kool-Aid. Oh, yeah. In all seriousness, I think I saw this on an episode of the Animaniacs once. Uchiha, Malaysia, then Bangladesh, Asia, and China, Korea, Japan. Following that exciting geography lesson, we are then introduced to Mr. Taco, the head of Pacific Pharmaceuticals. Yes, that's right, my fellow gorehounds. We get to meet the Big Cheese, the Big Cheese Taco, if you will, of Big Pharma himself. Wow, this has just been such a pleasure. I, I'm such a lucky boy. I can't wait to go home. Anyway, it turns out one of his scientists, Dr. Makino here, has recently discovered red berries that could be used as a potential cancer medication, but can't get more on account of a certain giant gorilla for which this movie happens to be named after. Naturally, Mr. Big Pharma here is far more interested in the gorilla part of this equation, because fuck helping people. Why would we do that when there's money to be made? Ape loads of money. You two are going to feral. Find me a genuine monster. And when you're done, bring me pictures of Spider-Man, goddammit! One thing I don't get, though, is if you're making an American cut anyway, why keep the Japanese Faro Island name in lieu of the far more American Skull Island name? Seems like that would make more sense to change than just adding more white people, but eh, what do I know? Anyway, we're next introduced to Sakurai, one of the men tasked with capturing Kong. And it turns out he has a dinner date with his sister Fumiko and her boyfriend Fujita, who I'm pretty sure has a magic penis. Stop! Stop! I'm convinced! Well, shit! Tenacious D were right! Cock push-ups really do work! It hurts my cock! Keep at it! You never know when you need to fuck your way out of a tight situation. Actually, it turns out Fujita invented a wire that is supposedly stronger than steel, which is totally not going to come into play later on in the movie. No, no, no. How could you possibly assume that? What is this Chekhov's gun you speak of? I've never heard of it. How come your boyfriend's steak is bigger than your brother's? Actually, they're about the same size, but don't worry, that's a common mistake. Guru, that joke was undercooked. Excuse you, sir, that joke was actually well Well done. done. (laughs) You know what? You're right. Please, it was also tasteless and bland. Well, I, for one, am glad we were able to settle this beef, despite Despite the the stakes stakes being being so so high. high. No, for the This is why you don't have more friends. Meanwhile, on the set of the Green Slime, a submarine investigates someone's bathtub after unusually hot waters were reported in the Arctic Ocean. This naturally leads to an iceberg grave. Turns out the light is actually Cherenkov light, or rather, the light that emits off of nuclear reactors when they're turned on. Thank you, Wikipedia. Which of course means... Captain, we're having a Geiger response. Yeah, and it's calling me an asshole. 
Shit, man, global warming really escalated lately. Well, I guess it actually has outside of this joke, so oh well. Unfortunately, though, there ain't enough maxi pads in the world to control this flow, and thus the submarine completely combusts. Shortly after that, a rescue helicopter arrives just in time to witness a kaiju's explosive diarrhea. <laughs> Sorry, guys, that taco was a bad choice. Anybody got any wet wipes? No? Oh, well, then. I guess I'll just go and, uh, destroy Tokyo. See ya. Fun fact, though, in the original Japanese cut, this was supposed to be the very same Godzilla from Godzilla Raids Again, who at the very end of that film was trapped frozen in an avalanche. But this, of course, was changed for the American cut so that now this is the only time anybody has ever seen or heard of Godzilla before. Despite the fact everyone seems to already know his name somehow? Godzilla! Godzilla. 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 Godzilla! Because continuity, we don't believe in no stinking continuity. Here in the States, anyway. He seems to be traveling in a straight line and on a predetermined course, though as yet we have no explanation as to why. Clearly it's because you're living in a side-scroller. Quick, whack him with your tail before they get ya! Oh, too late. Anyway, meanwhile on the set of The Mysterians... That's not a joke, by the way, as the footage of the satellite used in the American cut of this film was actually taken from a completely different Toho production, simply titled The Mysterians. The more you know. Elsewhere, we're introduced to a man supposedly named Dr. Shikasawa, but is clearly Dr. Sarazawa. Either way, though, in this instance, he's less the doctor and more the Minister of Defense. We must not panic. If there is one thing we cannot afford at this time, it is hysteria. I don't know about that. Last time I checked, hysteria is only about 10 bucks on Amazon. Unless you get the vinyl, of course, but that's a bit too hipster for my blood. If we do not destroy Godzilla, soon the monster will destroy us all. Or maybe he'll destroy all monsters. Ever think about that, smart guy? Anyway, the military rolls out the most adorable tanks I've ever seen. Oh my god, look at these things! They're so tiny! It's almost as if they're toys. Or maybe it's just a metaphor for how the tanks are but mere toys for Godzilla himself. Maybe. Or maybe not. Unfortunately for them, though, they make the tragic mistake of interrupting Godzilla's ice bath, which of course means it's stomping time! Yeah, that's right, run, you little bitches! Run like the little panzers you are! Well, actually, Guru, a panzer is a type of German tank, and those are clearly Japanese tanks, so your joke is wrong, wrong, wrong! Since when are you an expert on tanks? Well, uh, you know, during lockdown I played a... A lot of world of tanks. <laughs> like, really a lot. Too, Too much, much even. And remember, kids, only you can prevent kaiju fires. Damn, I don't know what Mr. Taco is on, but I definitely want some. Shove it right up my ass! No more! I'm sick of Godzilla! Whoa, 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 slow your roll, dude. That's blasphemy around these parts. And not the good kind of blasphemy either with all the sucking and fucking. The bad kind of blasphemy where you get kicked out of the temple for not sucking and fucking. I want my own monster. Find me a monster, fast. That, and uh, That's exactly I, 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 ten uh, words, sir. Oh, you, you, send it, send it! I'm not exactly sure how that message is supposed to reach these dudes on this toy boat here, but okay. Which reminds me, this film was actually the first production to film in Toho's Big Pool, which was the water tank that all Godzilla films would use up to and including Godzilla Final Wars. Which makes all of these water scenes a pretty fucking cool piece of kaiju history. Enough fun facts, though, as it's time to venture into the all-too-familiar world of Asian blackface. On the bright side, though, at least this tribe is gender-inclusive. Oh, Sa Sakurai, I am scared. Why? It looks like a friendly sort of island. Two men, one tribe, all meat. 
Japanese Cannibal Holocaust, coming to a grindhouse near you. Anyway, after arriving, Sakurai and his partner Kintsuburo introduced themselves to the natives in the most culturally sensitive way possible. Tell them a big boat is coming back for us tomorrow and smile with you. I smile. <laughs> yeah, nailed that one. So eventually, the dumbtastic duo do win over the chieftain using what I can only describe as the back to the future strategy. See, switch it on like this, and you get him my magic. Yeah, you fucking with some wet ass pussy. Wow, product placement was really fucking hardcore in the 60s. King Kong vs. Godzilla, brought to you by Cancer. You better not smoke it around home. Whoa, 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 whoa. Did I just show a clip in which two grown men hand a little boy in blackface two, two cigarettes? cigarettes? Well, that's it, you're canceled now. Oh, sh- Anyway, the slow death of nicotine is cut short by a thunderstorm, reminding all of the locals of their hairy god's wrath. <laughs> big spirit, big spirit, pray, pray. Mr. Kong, I know we don't talk very much, but if you could do this one teeny tiny thing for me and the rest of the villagers, it would be really swell. And that one thing I really want you to do is... STOP FLINGING POO AT US, YOU DAMN DIRTY APE! <laughs> Meanwhile in Stock Footage City, Fumiko is informed by her friend Tammy of some truly terrible news. Fujita's plane crashed. Flight 311X to Hokkaido crashes. I don't know how to tell you guys this, but uh, that's not a plane, that's a boat. For real though, it was 100% a boat in the Japanese cut. I have no idea why they changed that for the American cut. I guess Americans just don't know what boats are. Maybe he could be one of the survivors. Why don't you go to Hokkaido? Do not go to Hokkaido. <laughs> well, at least that answers that question. Enough about that though, as it's time to shoehorn in yet another American interlude. Alright then, Professor McWhitey, explain to us dumb Yanks who or what Godzilla is. I tend to classify him as a prehistoric species of dinosaur. Sure, he's a dinosaur, but uh, are you even going to mention the fact that it was the US government that enraged him by testing hydrogen bombs in his underwater habitat, or...? The fact that Godzilla is here forces us to reconsider many theories on suspended animation. Oh, nope, you're just going to gloss on over it. Okay, alright, I see what the score is here. Enough serious commentary, though, as it's time to check back in on The Great Cornholio. My corns hurt. Ah, you and your corn. But you, you see, my corns always hurt. They're near a monster. Man, that's weird as fuck, as personally, my corns tend to hurt during... Crippling depression. Anyway, the search for Kong is abruptly stopped by an avalanche. And by an avalanche, I mean in the Japanese cut, it is stopped by Kong himself. But the American cut crops this out for some stupid reason. I mean, I'm sure there is a reason, but I have no doubt that it was stupid. Uh, you see? My corns never die! Now that's just too corny. Enough of my bad puns, though, because it turns out this village is under attack by a giant octopus. And by a giant octopus, I of course mean a regular sized one. Aw, look at this adorable little squish! What a cutie pie! Or rather, what a cutie octopi! As it turns out, they actually had four octopuses on set. Octopuses? Octopi? Whichever it is, they had four of them. And in order to get them to move the way they wanted to on screen, they simply blew them with hot air. And after filming this scene, three of the octopi were released back into the wild, while the fourth one became special effects director Eiji Tsuburaya's dinner. And for those of you who don't know, Mr. Tsuburaya is the special effects visionary behind pretty much all of the special effects in the entirety of the Showa era of Godzilla films. So bow down before the real god of Zillas, foolish mortals. Anyway, let's get back to this absurd game of Calamari Damacy. And yes, I know calamari is squid, not octopus. Don't at me, bro. Ooh, nasty. Yeah, throw those toothpicks at that blue screen. That'll scare them off. Now this right here is the real blue screen of death. death. 
Unfortunately, though, the villagers all roll ones in their attempt to thwart the monstrous mollusk, which means it's time for the king to step in to claim his crown. Welp, it looks like Kong's gonna be octopied for a while. Watch out, man, that thing is well armed. Don't worry, though, my fellow gorehounds, Kong's got this. I mean, look! He's also got two forearms. <laughs> and I'm sincerely sorry for all the puns here, my dudes, but, uh, I just can't help cracking jokes. Anyway, after Kong gets his rocks off and the octopod slithers off, time for Kong to indulge in some delectable berry juice. I'm honestly not sure why the villagers are celebrating this, though, as the last thing I'd want to deal with is Kong with a hangover. Yikes. That's going to require some serious hair of the dogzilla, if you know what I mean. Now, the fact that Kong and Godzilla have appeared at the same time is interesting, scientifically. It's also interesting financially, considering this movie made over $10 million, and that's not even counting the merch sales. Alrighty then, let's check in on our zeros over on the USS Monkey business. And yes, I know King Kong is an ape, not a monkey. Stop adding me, bro! Hey, wait a minute! If these guys were on the inside, then why were their action figures already on the outside in the previous shot? My immersion is broken! <laughs> So Mr. Taco arrives via Operation Miniature Drop and gets a brief lesson in what could be called a contingency plan. Don't you understand? The raft's dynamite is wired to that fuse. Ah, shit, you guys are right. There's no way he'll survive the inevitable onslaught of Vote for Pedro shirts. I mean, I barely survived it back in the early 2000s. And even then, did I? Anyway, soon after that, the Japanese Self-Defense Force arrives to inform Mr. Taco that Japan really doesn't want another giant monster running around. Who is going to be responsible for King Kong? I am. All right, you are officially not allowed to wear that armband with that mustache, my dude. It just raises a lot of red flags, is all I'm saying. Fujita arrives home safe and sound, despite reports to the contrary. But oh no, Fumiko's already on her way to Hakado, which is where Godzilla was last spotted. Whatever will she do? 43 to control. Godzilla is approaching. He seems to be attracted by the train lights. Swing it, swing it, swing it. I'm gonna fuck that train's booty. Fujita arrives to save Fumiko while the other passengers escape via trucks and buses. Meanwhile, Godzilla fucks up James the Red Engine because fuck you and your little friends, Thomas. That motherfucker's definitely a diesel then, isn't he? Fujita successfully hides Fumiko from Godzilla while King Kong escapes. You know, like the title of the other movie starring King Kong. Seriously though, for a guy that looks like Hitler, Mr. Taco is really stalling here. King Kong is my no 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 you Don't do that. Unfortunately, the explosion merely further frees Kong, which sets the stage for our two monsters to finally fight. Round one. Fight. <laughs> Oh. Truly riveting. It appears this fight is getting bolder and bolder by the minute, folks. Time to place your bets. Heads for King Kong. Tails. Aw, come on, guys. Be nice. Kong might actually surprise you. I mean, look at how his arms magically grow in between shots. Didn't know he had that power now, did ya? Bruh. Anyway, Godzilla lets Kong get a whiff of the bad tacos he ate, while Kong decides that this shit ain't worth it. Which I guess makes Godzilla Denzel Washington, because King Kong ain't got shit on him. Kong has retreated. Godzilla now reigns supreme and will, in all probability, continue his march towards Tokyo. Well, shit, the movie's over. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and don't forget to... Nah, just kidding. This shit ain't over till Big Chungus sings. So anyway, the military comes up with a plan to Viet Cong Godzilla's ass by digging a huge hole filled with explosives, poisonous gas, and fire. But if you're wondering why this plan centers solely around Godzilla, that's because in the Japanese cut, they actually hatched it before they were aware that King Kong had escaped. Which makes way more sense. Enough about that, though, because I think the channel just changed to a late 90s toy commercial. Drop, drop, drop.
Doctor's got the saw. Wanna lift it, load it, haul it, dump it, pull it, push it, grab it, bump it. The military eventually springs their plan into action, and it goes pretty well, actually. Dooby 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 oh Unfortunately, while the plan may have been foolproof, it certainly wasn't Godzilla-proof. So they hatch a new plan involving high-powered electrical lines, though I seriously question their logic here. It was observed in his attack on the train at Hokkaido that he moved away from the high-tension wires whenever possible. You just gotta love these pointless changes made from the Japanese to the American cut. Because it certainly looks like he didn't give two shits about those power lines from where I'm sitting. Which is on a couch, of course. Wait a minute. This isn't a couch. My life is a lie. Worry not, though, my fellow Gorehounds, for the logic gets even dumber. For some reason we do not yet understand, Kong draws strength from electric voltage. Actually, I do understand the reason, and it's pretty obvious when you think about it. Remember when I said the original concept for this movie involved King Kong going up against a souped-up Frankenstein's monster? Yeah, so while Frankenstein's monster, or Prometheus as he was called to avoid copyright issues, was removed in Toho's rewrites of the original script, they still kept a few key plot elements, and one such element was Prometheus' ability to power up using electricity. An obvious nod to the fact that the monster was first brought to life using lightning. Now, I couldn't find an official stated reason for this, but I have a feeling it has something to do with giving King Kong a power that could rival Godzilla's atomic breath for the same reason the newer movie gave him that super-powered Godzilla scale axe. But that's just my guess and I have no way of knowing for sure. But you gotta admit, it's a pretty good guess. Anyway, the military engages Operation Jurassic Park, and I just love Godzilla's reaction here as he pieces together what to do about all these damn power lines. Fear not, though, Godzilla, because King Kong has arrived, and he knows exactly what to do. Mm-mm, spicy ramen. Someone better call Peter Gabriel because I smell a lawsuit. Quick, evacuate everybody before the film quality completely degrades. Nothing like watching a giant ape destroy your homes to leave you feeling a little blue, though. Anyway, after the ape shit hits the fan, the government officials debate on whether or not dropping an atomic bomb on the kaijus would be a good idea. The atom bomb is ready and waiting, but first we must evacuate Tokyo and perhaps all Japan. Sir, do you want more kaijus? Because that's how you get more kaijus. Anyway, Fujita and Fumiko are separated when their train gets too full, while King Kong's out here looking high as a motherfucker. It's like there are teeny tiny little people scurrying inside, man. All I'm saying is Fumiko here better hope that King Kong don't got the munchies. Hang in there, girl. The Hot Wheels Calvary is on the way. She's alive, but we can't hold our fire for long. King Kong must not be allowed to escape. Yeah, and if he escapes again, then he'll have to fight Mecha Kong. And trust me when I say, y'all don't want none of that shit. But I certainly do. Anyway, with all our heroes finally gathered in one place, they collectively come up with a plan to knock Kong out using the berry juice from the island. Taco, I hope we're right. Ha! King Kong can't make a monkey out of us. See, if the movie can make monkey jokes even though King Kong's an ape, then I can too, damn it. That's right, I'm putting my foot down. Monkey jokes are okay for King Kong. You heard it here first, folks. Fumiko passes out from blue screen exposure, while the military peppers Kong with, I guess what you could call, berry juice gas? And in order to set the mood just right, they also blast a recording of the island people singing to Kong. Hey, help out, my arms are tired. I'll, uh, take things your girlfriend said for 100, Alex. Man, when they said they were making a live-action Donkey Kong, I didn't think they meant the original Donkey Kong. I guess that makes the guy with the magic dick Mario then, huh? Here we go! Yahoo! Ooh. So they successfully rescue Famiko from King Kong's grass, but now what? Well, with Godzilla still rampaging around Mount Fuji, our heroes come up with the most logical of solutions. Kong versus Godzilla. If we are lucky, both will die. 
Let them fight. Uh, I don't know if you know this, sir, but generally a fight ends when one person's left standing. You're banking a whole lot on this whole they'll both die plan is all I'm saying. Far be it from me to complain, though, as I've been itching for some fighting. But wait, how will they physically get Kong to Godzilla in the first place? Well, my fellow gorehounds, do you remember Fujita's magic penis? Of course you do. An airlift with balloons. Your wire will hold Kong, won't it? Sure. All right. And that right there's the look of a man who's completely given up at this point. <laughs> Well, this effect held up. Anyway, they arrive at Mount Fuji the next day, which means it's time for the final showdown. Well, I thought this was gonna be a fight, but apparently Kong has far more disturbing plans. Yes, put your hands all over me, you damn dirty ape. Oh my. This is like watching Mario fight Bowser in Mario 64, but with a busted ass controller. You know, the one your brother made you play with so that he could win. That conniving, hit spamming son, son of a whore. whore. Anyway, where was I? Oh yeah, the monsters trade blows and then hug it out like men, but unfortunately Kong keeps getting destroyed. Which of course means it's time to make like an early 2000s fangirl and glomp. Now that's what I call rolling with the punches. <laughs> Godzilla successfully gets Kong graveling at his feet, but it turns out Kong is playing possum. Kong and kick! The animation here really stopped Kong's motion, if you know what I mean. In all seriousness though, this is actually a really cool nod to the original King Kong's effects, which was also done with stop motion, so I actually really love this effect, even though it looks goofy as hell in this movie, so let that be known. So anyway, to get back to the riffing, King Kong gets stoned as hell while Godzilla starts roasting him harder than Gary Busey roasted himself. <laughs> It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! Oh shit, it's static electricity! Godzilla's one weakness! If only Japan had tried this before, they could have saved a buttload on model train sets. Eat your broccoli, bitch! Okay, at this point, they're just siblings fighting over dad's Lego set. Eventually, though, they both tumble into the ocean, but not before their fight causes a massive earthquake and flooding. But like any good Smash Brothers brawl, there can only be one true winner. Unless you're, uh, Freddy vs. Jason, of course. In which case, we the audience are the true winners. And, and the, the winner, winner is... is King Kong! Kong! So that was the American cut of King Kong vs. Godzilla. And my final verdict? Well, it's an enjoyable monster brawl, but it's definitely a step down from the Japanese cut if you've actually seen it. You see, the original Japanese cut of King Kong vs. Godzilla was actually a satire, taking aim at corporate advertising in the rising age of 1960s television. And the reason that version of Taco wanted to capture Kong in the first place is to boost his ratings and increase the number of eyeballs watching his company's advertisements. Or as director Ishiru Honda himself put it, All a medicine company would have to do is just produce good medicine, you know? But the company doesn't think that way. They think they'll get ahead of their competitors if they can get a monster to promote their product. Unfortunately, most of this plotline and its attached commentary is absolutely shredded in the American cut. An example of this is a scene in the Japanese version after Godzilla Awakens where instead of getting mad that people are literally dying out there, Mr. Taco becomes absolutely enraged when he realizes that all the press for Godzilla is making his competitors more money than him. The American cut, on the other hand, doesn't even mention his competitors and instead just has him mad because he's simply tired of Godzilla. I'm sick of Godzilla. 
Thus, the social commentary is now muted and its potency greatly diminished. That being said, if all you really want is a cheesy monster brawl, then the American cut will still absolutely satisfy. But if you're looking for something with a little bit more substance, then I would absolutely recommend the Japanese cut over the American cut any day of the week. Because it still has the cheesy monster brawls that you're desperately craving, just with a bit more meaning attached. That's wonderful. I hope we've seen the last of them. Well, considering there are 34 Godzilla films after this, and 9 King Kong films, and counting, I think it's safe to say that no, this is not the last we'll see of either of them. See? Switch it on, like this, and you get them my magic. Anyway, my fellow Gorehounds, if you enjoyed this Kaiju Riff review, then check out this other one I did on Ghidra the Three-Headed Monster. Because sometimes three heads are better than one. And with that said, peace out, my fellow Gorehounds, and I'll catch y'all later. <laughs>